Okay, so tonight we're going to be covering chapter four. Uh, so we're going to talk about just now focusing everything we talked about yesterday. Uh, others, third party, throw that out of your mind. The only thing we're focusing tonight on is going to end up being just sellers. So we're only talking about you as a listing agent, not you as a buyer's agent, not as a lender. Or any, we're talking exclusively focused on dealing with the seller, okay, being a listing agent. So that's where our, our discussion for this evening. So seller's agency. Well, seller's agent seeks buyers for the seller's property. Okay, so if, for example, Miss Leela goes out and she ends up, um, she decides that, you know, I'm going to go sell my property and she comes to you, uh, Mr. Eugene, and she says to you, she says, I want you to sell my property. What she's asking you to do is to find buyers for her. Okay. So in that situation, Ms. Lila wants you to find a buyer that's going to purchase her house. Okay. So, of course, though, you as an agent are not going to be the person that's making that contract. It's going to be me, the broker, who is actually going to be dealing with that. Now, here's where it gets very confusing for agents. Very confusing. When we talk about seller, what are we doing? We're talking about the person that's selling. So, if, if I was telling you that, Mr. Eugene, you're working with Leela to sell her property, what would you think you're called? Listing agent. Well, not really. You think you call it the seller's agent, right? Seller's agent. Okay. That's what a normal person's going to think is that I'm the seller's agent. Mm -hmm. But in reality, Mr. Eugene, what did you call yourself first? Just the listing agent. So in that situation is the listing agent works with the seller. The buyer's agent, if Miss Linda comes in and she represents you, yeah. or represent, say, Travis, okay, in purchasing, then in that particular situation is Miss Linda is a selling agent. Can you already see a problem here? Yeah. Seller, seller and seller. selling. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'm very confused. Yep. And I noticed when I walked in the store, that's when y'all started this talking. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so in this situation is seller, if you want to make it simple for you, you can put listing. So when you're representing a seller, you're representing, in that particular situation, you represent the seller, you're a listing agent. Okay, you're not the selling agent. The selling agent is the buyer's agent. And yes, that gets very confusing. And like Travis said, when you're dealing with it on the MLS and you're listing the property and you're like, why won't it let me put selling agent in here? Why does it keep saying no? Because the fact is, is you're not the selling agent, you're the listing agent. Okay, so the selling agent. <clears throat> Actually, I tell people this all the time. The selling agent is the one that kind of has it easy. They really do. They honestly have it pretty easy. Because here's the thing. If I want to go over and I want to represent, say, Miss uh, or Mr. Keith. Say I want to represent Mr. Keith. Okay. Mr. Keith contacts Justin. I say, hey, Mr. Keith, how's it going? Everything going good? He's like, man, it's going good. I say, okay, well, here's some forms that I need to give you, Mr. Keith, and I need you to get all this information back to me. So, Mr. Keith, here's the stuff I need you to complete. When you finish, give it back to me. Mr. Keith completes it. I come back in. I sit down. I type it into the MLS, and I enter it. And then in that situation, as I've now entered that into the MLS, and guess what ends up happening? The house is out there. Now I'll go and I'll put a sign up. And then my very next step is to what? What do y'all think? After I put a sign up, I put the lockbox and I put it in the MLS, what's the very next thing I should end up doing? Next thing I need to get on the books. Appraisal? No. Remember, I'm trying to find a buyer. Oh. It's called an O. It starts with an O, Aiden. An open house. I need to get an open house on the market. That's a key thing. 
Because people want to end up doing what? They want to come in and they want to look at the house. So, Mr. Aiden, question. Yes, sir. Have you ever bought a car before in your life? Okay. When you bought a car in your life, sir, did you just look at it from far away? And be like, that's the one I want? No. That's not how this works? No. Oh, I know what it was. You go online and look through pictures, and then that's the one I want. No. No? What did you do? Please don't tell me you actually went over and actually got in it and looked at it and drove it. Please don't say that. Oh, I took it for a good test drive. What? Oh, yeah. You drove it? Oh, yeah. I had to make sure she went smooth. And you got inside? Oh, yeah. So what happens when your client says, I don't want to do an open house? <laughs> well, What's that basically doing to the audience or the potential people that want to buy? Closing them out. You shut them out. Now, you, have, you don't happen to have that issue, do you? <laughs> yeah. Huh? Unfortunately. Unfortunately, yeah. Justin. Yes, Miss Leela. Can you do like a virtual open house? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. But I'll tell you in that situation here, Miss Leela, even with the virtual open house, there's still going to be people, and I'm going to be honest there, and I'm not picking on her, but there's people like my mother who you, she can look at pictures all day and videos all day, and she still does what, Miss Linda? I still got to see that thing, right? She still wants to get in there. She still wants to go in and look at it because unfortunately, Miss Leela and, and Mr. Grossman can tell you, and maybe even Aiden and Travis can tell you, is do you think they're going to actually make the house in any videos or pictures look exactly like the house looks? No. Nope. Nope. What do they do to it? <laughs> it looks right. real big. It looks it's real big, big, right? It's real bright. It's real yeah, nice. beautiful, it's right? Really, really clean. Yeah, yeah. really clean. That's what they show. So, Miss Miss Leela, I'll, I'll explain what I've talked about here. There's a website called Box Brownie, okay? And this website, what it ends up doing is, uh, like Stefan, me and him, I believe we went out and took those pictures of that one. But yeah, me and Stefan went out, we took pictures of this one property, and my client, or well, Stefan's client, ended up said, said that I don't want the garbage pile next to the house to be in the photos. It's going to diminish the people that want to come look at it. So we ended up, we sent it off to this website and said, we want to remove this big mess from the house, from the photos. Can you do it? And they were like, sure. Also, would you like us to brighten the grass and make it look greener and put some flowers in and all of this? Yes. At that point, what do we do? Yep. We want to make this house look beautiful. So in virtual tours, what they end up doing is you can go into an office, <clears throat> take a video, send it off to these places, and then what they end up doing is they enhance them. And they make them look so beautiful, okay? So in that situation is, you don't want to end up in that particular area where you're just trusting the, the virtual tours. You actually want to go in and look. But yes, that you can do virtual tours, but your client should never rely on them for accuracy. Yes, Ms. Linda? On the virtual tour, I remember one agent went out there and did a virtual tour, uh -huh. and you were notified by MLS that the sign could not be in the picture. Well, yeah. So there is stipulations. A lot or of, is that right? That's correct. There's a lot of stipulations on how uh, you can end up in that particular situation, how you can take those leads. Okay, I was just okay. or how, about that. how you can put stuff in there. But yes, virtual tours are great, and virtual open houses are great. Um, so long as you end up here in real time, okay? Now, I have done this before, Miss Leela, and I'll say this. I've been in an open house before. This was back when I practiced a lot myself, and I had my phone, and I had Skype. And I ended up, I'd be sitting in the kitchen, and I would tell people, if you don't want to come in, this was before COVID, but if you don't want to come in, you're more than welcome to Skype, and here's my Skype address, my stuff. Click on it, you can have a visual conversation to with me. You don't have to walk in the house. Okay? Now that's fine because what happens? Do you think I can edit my phone as I'm walking through the house? No, you're gonna see exactly what it looks like. Okay. So there can be those situations, but the stuff that you see online is often enhanced majorly. Okay. Uh, there's also, I know of brokers around town and even outside of our town 
that they end up, they have pictures of from when the house was first built. So the house looked beautiful, but Aiden's lived in it for about four years, and you can just imagine what it looks like. Okay? I don't know. He might have a pretty <laughs> house. So in that situation is, you got to be careful. Okay. Yeah, you got to be very careful in these situations. But open, open houses can be very beneficial, and they can also be uh, sometimes detrimental. Depends on how it's how it's utilized. Now, again, one of the other thing is, of course, you're going to be dealing with a listing broker, but you're also going to have what's called cooperating brokers. Okay, and cooperating brokers is this: when I end up putting the listing into the MLS, I end up. I'm telling y'all, say that everybody here tonight listening to me. Every one of y'all are part of the MLS, okay? I put a listing out there, and I'm telling everybody that's part of this multi-member organization that if you bring me a buyer, I'll give you 3%. Now, am I really giving 3%? No, who's giving the 3%? The seller, okay? But I'm, I'm putting it out here that me as the broker will give 3% to you because my listing agreement says so, which the seller's the one doing it, not Justin, okay? Now, Travis, let me ask you this. Can you do this? Can you go talk to Ms. Davenport and say, Ms. Davenport, I'm gonna list your property and we're gonna list it for 6% and you put in the contract that you're gonna give 3% to the cooperating broker and then you put it in the MLS and put 1%. Can you do that? Why can't you do that? That's not what the contract says, is it? Okay. Whatever your listing contract says has to follow what you have in the MLS. You cannot, there are brokers that have gotten in trouble that they will go over there and they'll get their client to put 6%, but then they'll go into the MLS and put 1%. Okay. What happens in that particular situation is, is now that broker is in trouble. Okay. Now, in regards to cooperating brokers, again, those are some of the positives that come along with it. Now, of course, buyer's agent is going to seek the property for the buyer, okay? So, ultimately, the key thing is, is the selling broker is the one that puts the sign out there and basically, you don't so much just let it be. Miss, Miss Linda, question. Should you have, end up in this particular situation if Aiden just got a listing right now? Does all Aiden need to do is go put a sign up, a lockbox, put it on the MLS, and then he go sit over here in the corner and, you know, play video games? Heck no, what's his problem? Why can't he do that? There, that's when the work starts. You mean he can't sit over here and play video games? Nope, you better not let me see that. Uh oh, Aiden. You better watch out, man. The new Call of Duty just came out. The new Call of Duty? That's why I sit behind him. So in that situation is no, you cannot in that situation step back. I tell agents this all the time. You want to get a bunch of leads? Here's what you do. Here's what you do. Get a new listing and you immediately get that listing and you end up, you get all your ducks in a row. So before you go over there and you even put a sign in the yard, you go over there, you get it on the MLS ready, you get everything together. And then when you're ready, and understand in your listing agreement, you only have five days, five days to have everything done on that house. Five days. If you don't, you, so let's, let's put it in a little bit more hypothetical here. If Mr. Aiden, you go sign a contract, a listing contract with Mr. Keith, say you did that Monday, and you don't get his property on the market till next Monday, what have you just done? You breached that contract. And who actually breached the contract? Who's the contract between? Me, oh, you and Mr. Me and Mr. Keith. Uh -huh. Gotcha. So who gets sued? <laughs> Me. And if I get sued and I get my license suspended, what happens to the entire brokerage? Nobody got nothing, right? Everybody is what? SOL. Okay. <laughs> So in that situation is, do you see why it's very important on deadlines? Why it's very important that your broker always says, see, the, the term in brokerages is normally you have three days. So if you sign a contract with Mr. Keith, you have three days to get me that contract. But you only have two more days to do what? To get that property listed. 
And then you say, but you come to me, say you get it to me on the third day, and you say, well, Justin, it's no problem. I called Mr. Keith, and Mr. Keith said that I can wait till Monday. Does that does that suffice? No, what's the contract say? It says five days. You've already used three. You have two. Even though you and Mr. Keith talked, is that going to hold up in a court of law? Nope. Uh -uh. What should you do, uh, Aiden? What do you think? What's Travis doing back there? Do it again. He's being what? Right. Right. He's being writing. He's being writing that states that I spoke with Mr. Keith, and Mr. Keith has let me amend the contract to X amount of days. Now, I'll tell you all something. A lot of the MLSs lately are starting to come in and audit books. Because the MLS, when you're listing something, they have access to those listing contracts. And sometimes buyer contracts. So they could walk in tomorrow and say, okay, Aiden, which properties do you have uh, listed on the MLS? I got these three. Okay, I want to see all of those listing contracts. And I want to see proof that you met all those. You got it? That's what you got to be thinking about. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah that's my other computer. I got to know somewhere, right? Come back somewhere. Uh -huh. Y'all, when it comes to audit time, they ain't worried about that. I've sat through many audits. Yep. They don't care about that. Yep. They want what they want then. Yep. And they ain't gonna they don't wave it most of the time. We had a we had a minor heart attack today when uh when Linda answered the phone and I heard her say, Hello, this is Linda and they said, Yes, this is so and so and I heard I heard her say who who the Texas Real Estate Commission? And I almost jumped out of my seat. <laughs> I was like, what's the Texas Real Estate Commission calling my office for? Because in that situation is, they they sometimes will. They'll call your office and they will say, hello, Mr. Aiden, this is uh, such and such with Texas Real Estate Commission, and we will be conducting a field audit of your, of your property or your office uh, next week. We'll see you next week. And if that happens, guess what? The broker comes over and says, I need everything that you've done, every email, everything that you got. I need them all right here, and I need it all done. And then some agents will say, well, I quit. I'm out of here. Deuces. I quit real estate. Well, guess what? Your name's already on it. You're still stuck in the contract no matter where you go. Okay? So in that situation is you got to keep all your stuff, and you got to work in cooperation with your brokers. Okay? you got to keep up to date with it. Because if you don't have these things together and you're not keeping your documents together, what ends up happening is they can come after you. And if you don't have a complete file, I have to go back and look. But I think it's up to $2,500 for, in, you know, for each incomplete file. And then the broker gets fined 1000 for each one, too. So they'll find you $2,500 and then sue the broker 1000 And if there's multiple, they can suspend the whole brokerage. So... Very important in those situations. That's why Miss Linda, she loves to harp on people. Not that she's mean. She's ending up, she's harping on you because the whole purpose is, is that she's got to end up, she's got to keep us in compliance. Okay. Now, in regards to our outlines for tonight, we're going to talk about listing agreements, exclusive seller, benefits, non-exclusive, and disclosure issues. Okay. All right. So listing agreements, put it all up here real quick. So listing agreements, this is basically your employment contract. If I go out and I meet with Mr. Colton tonight and he wants me to list his property, it's between me and Colton. And it creates what's called an expressed agency. Expressed is what I'm doing right now, telling you. Either verbally or I write it out, I'm expressing myself. That's expressed. Implied, and like we talked about in some other classes, is my actions. If I go out and I just say, hey, Aiden, come on, let's go look at some properties. When we start looking at properties, and then you start telling Miss Davenport, when we get to the property, oh yeah, this is my, my agent. Even though we have no written contract, guess what? You now just created, I've been created an implied contract with you. Okay? So in these particular situations, we have to be able to know the differences. Also, the seller gives authority and compensation in the employment contract, which is the listing agreement. 
never, and they ask this question all the time on the license exam, never is the commission agreement in the contract. Never for the listing, okay? It's in the listing agreement. The broker, of course, agrees to market and place the client above themselves. We've talked about that many times. And they also, this is very key here. You got the slides or you got it wrote down, you're taking notes. I want you to write down those three words. Miss Linda, what does those three words say right there, ma'am? Ready, willing, and able. What's that mean? You better be ready to go. Well, the question is, this is how it comes down to it. Are you ready to purchase the house, Miss Linda? Yes. Are you willing to purchase the house? Yes. yes. Are you able financially to buy the house? Yes. yes. If those are all done, and I put a contract in, Miss Linda, guess what ends up happening? I'm owed a commission. Say that again. You're owed a commission. Now, now here's what I'm saying. Oh. Mr. Travis, you go show Miss Linda a house. She is ready to buy it. She's even willing to purchase it. And you just got notice from Miss Davenport, her lender, that she's able to purchase it. Okay? So he's okay at this situation. She's ready, willing, and able. They go under contract. And Miss Linda goes over and she ends up decides, yeah, I don't want to buy this now. Appreciate uh, appreciate your time, Travis. See you later. Well, is that okay with you, Travis? No. No. Okay, but Stefan, so Linda, because she just didn't feel like buying the house, she leaves. She don't have to pay Travis nothing, right? That's how this works. No. No? Well, do you mean she's got to actually buy the house? Yeah. She's got to buy the house. But just, can't you say I have a, I had a speaking nope, moment? Nope. Doesn't matter what your excuse is. If Travis produces a ready, willing, and able buyer, he is entitled to commission. Give you an example, a real life situation. We had a listing. We produced a ready, willing, and able buyer. Came in, ready, willing, and able. I put a contract in, ended up, they were talking about it, and the seller decided I don't want to end up, I don't want to purchase this house anymore. Or sell this house anymore. I don't want to sell it. We got him a ready, willing, and able buyer. And he said, yeah, I don't want to buy this house anymore. Or sell, sell this house anymore. Guess what? I'm entitled to what? 6%. Because I represent the seller, and I also brought in a what? Ready, willing, and able buyer. If the buyer walks away, guess what? Or not the buyer. The seller walks away, the buyer or the buyer's still there, you're still owed a commission. Let me make that clear because I know I kind of fumbled through that. If you are a listing agent and you bring a ready, willing, and able buyer, and the buyer tells you, Aiden, I'm not ready to sell my house now, I just changed my mind, guess what? In that particular situation, commission is still open. Period. Period. Okay. And they can sell them, right? Not the buyer, but so. If the seller walks away, I yes. keep getting them always mixed up. Yeah. So normally the person that walks away is the buyer. That's why it keeps getting me all the time. The buyer always walks away. But yes, there can be a chance that the seller will walk away. Okay. Now, like we talked about again here. In regards to express and implied agreement. Express contracts are clear and unambiguous. Okay? They are concise. They're clear. They are either written or oral. And the associates are going to be the agents of the broker. Okay? The broker represents the seller as a listing broker or an agent of the listing broker. Thus, they're a sub-agent of the seller. So in this situation, if I'm representing a seller, 
and I'm the listing broker. But if any of you are representing somebody on my behalf, you're an agent of the listing broker. That's why you're a real estate agent. Okay. Now, implied is words or conduct. So they're usually unintended. The agreement or fees are not going to be necessary. The key thing in this situation is about this one with implied is through the actions. Through me going out and me showing a contract, that's why I tell people all the time is, it's better to get a representation contract because with the representation contract, you at least know what your duties are. You don't have a representation contract, the world gets the decision of those duties, okay? Now, non-fiduciary duties in Texas, like we talked last night, is honesty, fairness, and competency. So in this particular situation, these are basically duties that are owed to people that are not clients, okay? We also have to provide good faith and disclosure of material facts. So Mr. Eugene, I have to be honest and be truthful with you. I cannot conceal things from you. I cannot hide things from you. I have to, in this particular situation, I have to be honest, truthful, fair, competent, and also provide disclosure to you. Again, TREC does rule on certain rules of fairness, but remember, fairness does not mean equality. Okay? Again, like we talked about last night, you must avoid misrepresentation and false promises. Okay? You must end up avoiding any misrepresentation and or false promises. Ms. Davenport, you were with us last night. Can I use the word guarantee with a client? Should I ever use that word? Why not? I can't guarantee nothing. Client asks me all the time, can I go ahead and uh, sell this house of mine? And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Do you guarantee it's going to actually close? No. <laughs> Mr. Grossman, can you ever guarantee anything? No. Why not? Because something can always happen. Exactly. Anything can happen. And it probably will. Uh huh. Stefan's learning the, the, the Justin method. You don't get happy until when, Stefan? All right, so closing is Monday. Yeah. You got your check. When you got that check in your hand, then you can get happy. When a client calls me or an agent calls me and goes, guess what? Guess what, Mr. Nobles? Guess what? And I'm like, what? 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 What's going on? What, what you got, Aiden? What, what's going on, man? And Aiden's like, I just signed a million dollar contract to list a person's property. Wonderful, Aiden, but I'm not too happy yet. Well, why aren't you happy? Because it's probably knowing my luck, it's just not going to close. It's just going to sit there and you're just going to spend a lot of time. And when something does happen good, guess what I end up doing? I'm like, holy crap, something actually happened positive for me once in my life. Okay. Is that not right, Stephen? Uh-huh. So again, in these situations, as you never go out and spend your money until you've actually funded. Okay. Now, what are the types of listing agreements? Now, this is where it gets fun. Miss Linda, you ready? Not really. Oh, yeah. It's about to get fun now, Miss Linda. I'm tired. A Aiden's going to teach you all this stuff here. He's going to be up here. He's going to come talk about it. Exclusive right to sell. So. Uh, <laughs> Sure. Yeah. All right. So, Mr. Aiden, question for you, sir. What's an exclusive right to sell? Uh, it's that you're the only one that has the ability to, how do I word it? Means if, you they, gotta, if they do sell in any, any type of way, you get paid. If they sell in any, any type, type of way, you get a paycheck. Yeah. So, but let me ask you this. So, you're representing Miss <coughs> Leela. Okay. And Miss Leela signs an exclusive right to sell with you. Sure. And Miss Leela goes over and her best friend, Miss Davenport, decides to come in and buy the house. So she don't need your services anymore. Do you get paid? Yep. What? You're going to charge Miss Leela when she got her own best friend to buy her house? Sure am. Man, Miss Leela, don't you use Aiden. He, I he, see. He's greedy here. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, 
yes, in this situation is, is that yes, in an exclusive right to sell, you end up getting paid no matter who it is. And 99% if you're working in residential real estate, it's going to include an exclusive right to sell. Okay. And the reason being is, and I'll explain why, and as we go through these contracts, you'll understand. But what actually happens is that say now, Mr. Travis, you go over here and you represent Miss Linda again. Oh. I still don't know why you haven't learned from it yet, Mr. Travis. Do it, yeah. <laughs> so Mr. Travis goes over and he represents Miss Linda and he has what's called an exclusive agency. Not an exclusive right to sell, but an exclusive agency. So he goes and he gets Miss Linda under an exclusive agency, and Miss Linda is always at every showing for some reason. Travis, every time you show the house, Miss Linda's there. I wonder why. So every time Travis is going around showing the property, guess what ends up happening? Miss Linda is there talking to the clients. So here, all of a sudden, comes Miss Lillian one day and. And she goes, hey, Miss Leela, how you doing? And they start talking up a conversation, and Travis gets busy, so he ignores it. And next thing you know, Miss Linda says, well, Miss Leela, girl, we need to go to lunch. Let me get your phone number. Let me write this down and everything. Thank you. Da, 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 da. All right, Travis, well, y'all go on. Y'all have a great day. I'll talk to you later, Travis. Okay? Well, after Travis leaves, her own agent, what do you think Miss Linda does? Hey, Miss Leela, how's it going? Hey, you know, now that the agent's gone and everything, if you end up just putting your contract in with me and all, you know, I'll actually, since I ain't got to pay Travis $5,000, I'll just knock it off the price. We call it a day and let's get this deal done. We'll just kick Travis out of it. That's what happens when you deal with an exclusive agency. Okay? Exclusive agency, you literally do not want to touch it because the seller can sell the property right behind your back. Okay? Open listings, if you ever are an agent, one of my agents, don't waste your time with this. An open listing's this. Mr. Eugene, you go in and you uh, talk to Aiden and you tell Aiden, yeah, I want you to list my house for me. So Aiden goes over and he's like, all right, Mr. Eugene, I've got an exclusive right to sell. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. I believe, in, I believe in more people that have access, the more chance my house is going to sell. So Aiden, here's what we're going to do. You're going to put your sign up, but also I'm going to let everybody else that's a broker in town also come put their sign up too. And whichever one of y'all bring me a buyer, that's the one that's getting paid. But if I bring my own buyer, then you have, none of y'all get nothing. That's how it's going to be. Well, Aiden, if you're a new agent, might do what? Yeah, hey, that's a sure listing. Let's do it. But here's the part. You ready for it? Open listings cannot be listed in the MLS. Why do you think that? Because only one broker can have a listing up. So if I put a listing under my firm and Keller Williams puts the set tries to put the same listing in the in the MLS as well, guess what happens? It's gonna flag. It. It's gonna say no. Can't happen. Okay. So in that situation, an open listing is only going to be good if you have a good market behind it. Okay, you have a good marketing strategy. Now, the lines of communication when dealing with what we call an exclusive right to sell. So, of course, we have our seller. And our seller is working through an exclusive right to sell. The seller works directly through the listing broker or the agent that the broker assigns to it. And then that listing broker works with the buyers. Okay. Now the buyers here could come from where, Mr. Aiden? Could it be another brokerage in town? Yeah. Yeah. Anywhere. Another broker in town could bring me a buyer. Okay. Still works. But ultimately, to get to the seller, they have to get through me. Okay. As you see here, other brokers. But here's that little wonderful little line right here. You see that little dash mark right here? So it says a buyer secured by the seller. So in this particular situation, is that first off, as we said, if it's a buyer directly, 
So I market the house in Facebook. I get a lead from Facebook. Well, that's my buyer. So the buyer is coming to me and I'm going to negotiate. So I'm an intermediary if I'm dealing with both. Okay. But if Mr. Eugene comes in, he's another broker. Well, the buyer is going to talk to Mr. Eugene, which Mr. Eugene talks to me. And then I go back and convey it to Mr. Seller. Okay. Or the buyer could be secured one of two ways. If Mr. Eugene finds his own seller or his own buyer, Mr. Eugene can either work directly with the buyer themselves and kick me out, or Mr. Eugene can tell the buyer, you need to talk to my broker and my broker will do everything. Okay. However, what did you say earlier, Aiden, about Ms. Leela? If Ms. Leela is the seller here and you're the listing broker, Miss Leela gets a buyer. Are you still entitled to a commission? Yes, sir. So you're telling me even if Miss Leela deals the whole transaction herself and does not use you at all, you're still going to charge her a commission? I mean, I, I would not just Miss Leela, anybody, but yes. He's trying to save himself there, Miss Leela. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting. <laughs> uh. it, it's all good. <laughs> Miss Leela was sending uh, fajitas over tonight. You just got kicked out. Sorry. So, so, sorry about that. So. Sorry, Miss Leela. I apologize. He'll get some applesauce. <laughs> but in that situation, yes, as an exclusive right to sell, uh, you end up, you get paid no matter how this chart works out. Okay. So again, it provides the greatest security to the broker. It also provides the most services to the seller because of why if you have if Garrett, if he's my client, I'm going to give Garrett the most attention. I'm going to spend all my time focusing on getting Garrett's house. So because I know no matter what I'm getting a paycheck. So no matter what it is, I'm getting paid. So it provides Garrett with the most services that I would give because I'm getting money no matter what. Now the broker paid if anyone, even the seller finds that one. And again, there is the TAR form. And if you look at your textbook, which is online, it's on page 98. That is the copy of the exclusive right to sell. Okay. Now, when dealing with a agency, an exclusive agency, okay, what you want to do in this situation, again, you got your seller. And again, we have the same normal little spin here. Okay. Same normal spin over here as well. But look what happens here on the last one. On the last one, if the seller procures a buyer, the seller can cut off that line between the seller and listing broker and handle the sale themselves and pay you Zippo. Zippo. So the key thing is, is whose benefit does it come to? It's the seller. Okay. So when a person tells me, if, if for example, that Garrett being a new agent comes into my office and tells me, says, Hey, Justin, um, I went and visited with, uh, Mr. Jarek over here and Mr. Jarek, he ended up, he wants to do an exclusive agency because he used to be a real estate agent. What's immediately going to come to my head? Red flags, red flags. If he was a previous agent and he's requesting an exclusive agency, what happens? He knows what's trying to happen. He wants Garrett to go over there and try to get the property out there and get Garrett to bring in buyers. So Jared can do what? He can go over and steal the buyer and kick everybody out and walk away with paying nobody. Okay. If a client asks for this type of listing, you always talk to your broker. You never agree to an exclusive agency without speaking to your broker. Because ultimately the broker needs to what? Be involved. Be involved in this decision. Okay. I would say that the broker should be involved in any kind of transaction with regardless. Unfortunately, they can't. 
What happens if you're Keller Williams and you have tens of thousands, even if hundreds of thousands of agents? How are you going to be able to be in every one of them? That's true. It's impossible. That's right. You bring in people that are team leads that come in that are trained and that are knowledgeable to go out there and help make those decisions. Okay. So again, other brokers work through the listing broker and the seller may find their own buyer and pay no commission. So what does that last thing say there, Miss Linda? Is that ever a wise idea? Imagine if those of you that like football, Super Bowls around the corner here. Imagine Aiden, if you're the who's who's in the Super Bowl this year, by the way. Chiefs Buccaneers. Okay. So let's say that you are one of the coaches for one of those teams, okay. and you're competing with your own team. What's going to happen to your team? Probably going to lose. Probably going to lose. Why? Because I should be competing against the other team. Yeah. You should be competing against others, not your own team. Same thing here with, with the real estate. If your broker is competing against the client, what's the what's the whole issue here? What's the thing? Internal struggle. The internal struggle, which is then going to end up crashing the whole situation. And guys and gals, trust me, I've dealt with that before. Okay. So again, I want to make certain that everybody understands that. Because very important. Okay. So, next thing. Lines of communication and negotiation in an open listing. The seller is going to end up dealing with, as we see here, different people. So, earlier, broker B said what? Broker B was listing agent. Now we have broker A, broker B. We could put broker C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. We could keep this thing going all day long. But the problem is here is guess what? All of these people here in this particular situation end up, they are all going in competing against each other. So just like Aiden I said earlier, this one, only one broker is competing. Over here, look at this. You have multiple brokers and the client. That's like, imagine Super Bowl, just everybody's out for themselves. Y'all are, are on certain teams, but everybody's out for themselves. How, how's that going to go? Chaos. Yeah. Okay. So open listings. The broker must be the procuring cause. And we're going to spend a minute talking about that in a second. So the broker must be the procuring cause to be paid. And the seller reserves the right to sell the property and not pay a commission to the listing broker. The disadvantage is, is it does not incentivize the broker, any of the brokers. Okay. Now, what exactly is this thing called procuring clause? What's this thing called procuring clause? Well, here's what we call procuring clause. Aiden, if you go out and you put a sign over in Mr. Colton's yard, and it's got your name, your phone number, your picture, and all that on it, and Mr. Grossman comes driving down the road one day, and he sees your sign. And he calls you, and he says, hey, Mr. Aiden, how's it going? You're like, oh, it's going great. Well, I'm looking to purchase a property, and I happen to like yours. I was just wondering, how much are you listing it for? Well, we're listing it for $5.99. Okay, how many acres? So oh, that's about 20 acres, okay. All right, well, I appreciate it, Mr. Aiden. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to contact Mr. Grossman, okay? And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm going to contact Mr. Grossman. Says I'm going to contact my agent, Mr. Eugene, and Mr. Eugene will get in contact with you. Mr. Eugene contacts you. Says, "Hey, Aiden, 
uh, I got a client that's interested in seeing your property, blah, 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 blah. Uh, can you give me a little more specifics about it? You tell the same thing you told Mr. Grossman. And then you tell Mr. Eugene, you say, well, Mr. Eugene, I got a question. What's your client's name? Well, his name is uh, Stephen Grossman. What you gonna tell him, Mr. Aiden? You're gonna tell Mr. Eugene. After he tells me his client Stephen? Uh-huh. In an open listing? Oh no. It's okay. just in a listing altogether. And I gotta tell him that I already spoke with him, that he's done. He's out of the I've already spoke with Stephen. Sorry, I gotta get out of here. That's right. If your client speaks to the other agent at all it can be grounds for you to lose your commission because you were not the procuring cause the only time your client should ever ever speak to the other agent is if you as the agent are on the phone so what should have happened was mr stephan should have contacted mr eugene Mr. Eugene should have done a three-way call with you, Mr. Aiden, and Mr. Stephan could have asked the questions he had of you while Mr. Eugene was on the phone. But if your client, and this happens, guys and gals, I'm going to tell you all, this happens a lot more. You want to talk about the worst sick feeling that you'll ever have in your life is when your client calls you after they've spoken to the other agent and says, Hi, Travis. This is Justin. How you doing, man? Hey, quick question. I just called Aiden and, you know, we've been looking for about 60 homes already. Well, I called Aiden. I found one. I think this is going to work out. Can you call Aiden and schedule a showing for me? Love that look. That's exactly what, it, what you think. Because what's that basically mean to you, Travis? In, in realtor terms, translate what I said in realtor terms. What did I just tell you? Hey, I found somebody else. So can you still do the work for me, but I'm not going to pay you. Exactly. Exactly. When your client goes and thinks they are helping you, they're really in reality screwing you. And let me tell you guys and gals, this is where it comes into that part, an extremely important part, and that's why I spend time talking about this, is procuring calls is very important. You, when you get a client, your first discussion with them is to do this. Don't call the other agent, period. Period. Don't you go even email them. Don't text them. Don't you talk to anybody. Anything that's real estate, you come to me. And I even myself personally will say this as well. Mr. Aiden, if you hired an attorney because you murdered somebody, okay, are you going to go over to Ms. Davenport, the prosecutor, and go talk to her and try to work a deal out yourself? No. Why not? I don't know what I'm talking about. That's right. And do you think Ms. Davenport's going to be really kind to you if you're a convicted murderer? No, no. No, not at all. So in that situation is, you don't, you wouldn't do that in real life with your life, then why would you do that with your most important asset? You would I'm the expert, let me do my job, and you talk to me. See, a lot of times realtors do what? I mean, not realtors, clients do what? They think they're helping you, when in reality, they're shooting you in the back, okay? And also, clients get very angry when things don't work exactly how they want it to work. And I'm going to tell you, in real estate, things don't work exactly how you want them to work. Okay? They, I'm sorry. They get upset if you don't call and communicate with them. Oh, yeah. You don't communicate? That's the number one way to lose clients. You get a client, you talk to them, and you say, hey, I'll get that information to you this evening. And you get it to them tomorrow. What happens, Travis? I've already with somebody else. Yeah. I had one lady, I called her, well, I got a lead. 
I answered the phone. I was driving. And I told her, I said, I'm five minutes from my office. I'll be back in my office and we'll talk. Give me five minutes. Got back to my office, walked up the door, sat down at the chair, hit the call button. She ended up, did not answer. Get a text back. Hey, thanks, Justin, for your time, but I've already talked to another agent. Appreciate it. Five minutes. Five minutes. Or my favorite one. Yeah, oh yeah, okay, yeah, I'll get I'll get all that out there. You know, you, we go to a listing presentation, client loves you, all of this stuff, they're in love, blah, 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 blah. And he said, yeah, I'll, I'll get those signs out there. I'll get that lockbox out there. I'll have it out there. It'll be out there Friday. Comes around Monday. That sign's not there. What's going to happen to that person? Gone. Gone. So it's imperative that you understand those different situations. You promise your client something, you keep it. The number one way to lose your license is not keeping your word, not communicating. Mr. Grossman told me today, we were chit-chatting, just talking. He says, well, I don't want to, I don't want to bother. I don't want to, it was like bothering. You feel like you're, when you're assertive or persistent, you feel like you're bothering them sometimes. He's like, I don't want to, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to be to that point. Well, in real estate, you bother them. You text them. You call them. You blow their phone up. Call them consistently. I would rather a customer call me and say, hey, Mr. Nobles, Travis calls me way too much. Can you tell him not to call me so much? I'd rather hear that phone call than, hey, I haven't heard from Travis and it's been three weeks. And I'm not saying Travis is that way. I'm just saying. They end up, they want to make certain that you're following up. And sometimes simply saying something is this. I get some agents that will say this. I'll come into the office and I'll say, hey, uh, I'm picking on eight here. Hey, did you, uh, did you go put that sign up for blah, blah, blah place? No, I haven't put that up yet because yeah, I've been busy. Okay, been busy. Or no, I haven't put it up because I was waiting to talk to you because I didn't know what you wanted me to do because this client happens to, me and Stephen ran into this. My client, the client wants me to do a listing or a, a for sale and a lease sign. So I didn't know how you wanted me to handle that. Okay, that's fine. That's completely fine. But my next question is, did you call your client and let your client know that you're waiting on your broker? Well, no, I was waiting to talk to you. No, 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 no. You need to let your client know, thank you for that information. I have to talk to my broker. He may not be able to get to me today, but I'll get back to you as soon as I can. I was telling Stefan today, you don't ever give deadlines. You don't tell a client that I'm going to be there Friday. Be there Friday. When you yourself know maybe you can't make it Friday. Best way to say it is, Ms. Davenport, if, you, if I'm listening to your house and I say, all right, now, Ms. Davenport, now understand that it is Thursday today. Now, I've got to get with my broker because i got to get X, Y, and Z stuff. I would love to be out here tomorrow, but just realistically, let's shoot for next week. Is that okay with you? I'll get it done next week. I just don't want to give you, tell you a date, not be here. Is that cool? And most people are going to say what? <laughs> she, well, see, she might go somewhere. See, that's good. Other people, they end up, they'd be fine with it. It just depends on the client. Now, if your client, now what she just said, I love she said it. What if she tells you, you tell her, well, I'll get back out here next week. And she says, well, I need it done this week. Then what should you do? Get out there this week. Yeah. And if you know your broker said, well, I'm going to be out of town, what should you do? You need to be blowing my phone up and Linda's phone and everybody else till they can get a hold to me, right? The key thing in this is, yes, most people are taught politeness. Be polite. If I call Ms. Davenport and say, hey, where are we with that contract? She says, I'm working on it. Okay, that sounds good, Ms. Davenport. Uh, you know, when can I expect it to be done? 
Well, I'm working. It'll be done by 5 today. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. What should I be doing at 4 o'clock? What do you think I should be doing at 4 o'clock? Calling her. Hey, Miss Davenport. Sorry to bug you again. Uh, hey, where are we at with that deal you said you're going to get to me? Oh, Justin, I've been so busy. Well, Miss Davenport, I actually have already told my client, would you like me to draft up the paperwork? I can draft it up for you. I'll, I'll sit by and we'll send it back over to you. Because she may seriously be busy. Find ways to help them, okay? Procuring calls is very important, okay? Very, very important. Now, net listing. Travis, you had a question. Or statement. Did, did you? No. no okay. Um, okay. Net listings. Now everybody's going to peek up. Darren's probably even going to peek up on this one. Okay. So on this one, a net listing, again, it's not illegal in Texas. But here's the thing y'all need to be aware of. It's very important. It refers to the way the broker is paid rather than a type of listing. The seller determines an amount of money they will accept after subtracting the cost of sale. So here's the thing. Oh, I got on here, Mike. Let's see here. Enrique. Enrique calls me out to his house. He says, Justin, I want you to list my property for me. I said, certainly, Enrique, let's, let's get this thing listed. He said, but I don't want to do all these dead blasted listing crap and all. Here's what I want. I want to walk away from my house. I want to have $200,000. After all closing calls, I want to walk away with $200,000. Okay. And I say, how are you going to pay me? And he says, I pay you what's over the $200,000. So you're going to let me have anything over $200,000 plus closing costs. Yep. So if I sell your house for a million dollars, you're going to give me everything over that $200,000. Yep. Okay. So I go and I put it on the market. I'm going to tell you the wrong way first. So I go on and I know that Enrique's property is worth $500,000. But I don't tell Enrique that. I put it on the market for $500,000. It sells for $500,000. They cut Enrique a check for 200 and cut me a check after expenses for $270,000. How you feel about that, Enrique? Sad. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Because in that situation, what just happened to Enrique? He got screwed out of that deal. Okay. So if I was a real estate or was not a real estate agent, I'm dope. I didn't violate any rules. Because I'm not a real estate agent. But if I'm a real estate agent, What's this last bullet here say, Mr. Eugene? A little last bullet right there. What's it say? Broker must advise owner, seller, as to licensee's opinion of price. So what's that mean? <clears throat> I just got to advise uh, oh, the, the, the licensee's. Uh, I got to advise Enrique, if I'm a licensee, how much that house is worth. And I have to provide him a CMA. So as a real estate agent, I have to go talk to Enrique and say, okay, Enrique, here is the CMA. Your house is worth $500,000. Are you still okay just taking $200,000? And if Enrique says yes, I'm going. But if Enrique says, heck no, now I want $400,000. I can't do that. I have to do what I have to do. Why would he ever say yes? Why would he ever say yes? Okay. So if an individual is in a high tax bracket, like a very high, say Miss Davenport, she has millions in the bank. Okay. 
by the way, she does, everybody, so y'all need to treat her nice. <laughs> but you got Miss Davenport here has a lot of money, we say. And she, if she sells her house, she's going to be put into the next tax bracket. She may want to end up just giving it, basically, quote, unquote, giving it to you and writing it off as an expense versus going over and getting the money and going into the next tax bracket. Now, of course, this Davenport's not going to give away $200,000, but she may, instead of giving you 3%, she may say, you know what, Stephen, I'll give you 30000 because I don't want to have to pay the tax bracket. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, exclusive selling or seller agencies. You only represent the seller. Okay, under an exclusive seller agency. You only represent the sellers, and the buyer always is the customer. So it clearly indicates buyer is not represented in this situation. So when you're dealing with this, if I am trans or dealing with the matter, the buyer is a customer. You have to remember this situation. If you are under contract, if Travis goes out and finds a seller, and Aiden, you find a buyer, you're both under who? Under me. So I'm still the middleman here. Aiden, you're here. Travis is here. Okay? Now, Aiden, when you bring a contract to Travis, you're representing the buyer. Travis is representing the seller. Is that okay? Yes. Okay? What if, however, Travis procures seller and buyer. And Travis, can you represent both parties? No, because of why? It's called dual agency. It's intermediary. And the only person that can be an intermediary is who? Me. And if I'm an intermediary, what happens? I basically am a middleman that just says, okay, buyer offer here, seller here. But no advice to either of you because I represent both of you. Now, how many of y'all want to hire somebody like that? Not a good idea. So the best way for a broker to do is what? All right, I got two people here. Mr. Travis, here you go. Mr. Aiden, here you go. Y'all two take care of them. I'm going to sit back here and create a Chinese wall to make certain that Aiden, you don't talk to Travis about confidential information and vice versa. Y'all can negotiate, but you can't tell Travis how much and vice versa. This has to be serious, okay? Now, on in-house sales, brokerage represent, or represents the seller only and the buyer is a customer. The sales associate represents the listing broker who represents the seller. Many brokers prefer in-house sales because they retain the control and receive full commission, okay? And this is a very bad thing right here. This is bottom line. A lot of brokers try to keep transactions in-house. Because if I keep all of my stuff in-house, what happens? I get 6%. I get bigger checks. Okay? Well, what happens when you keep everything in-house, Mr. Travis? What happens to your liability? Go down? It goes through the roof. Okay. So an exclusive seller agency in practice is that when we're dealing with this, now you got me coughing up here. Lord, have mercy. You'll be here tomorrow, right? Yeah. <laughs> so in this situation, Sally is an exclusive seller agency in practice, is a listing associate. Sally also can be a selling associate with no relationship, or Sally can be a selling associate with a prior relationship. Okay? But again, these are different methods. Now, what are the benefits in regards to the seller agency? Well, the benefits of the seller-landlord relationship is, number one, there's broad marketing, okay? 
and we have a very large range of buyers. See, many people, they get a listing and they'll look at the listing and if it's a $100,000 listing, they look at it and they're like, this is crap. This is crap. I ain't gonna go put a sign out here. Miss Linda, she gets a listing and she goes over and she's like, I don't wanna deal with this crap hoe. Oh, this is so much junk. I don't wanna deal with this. Well, here's the thing. This is what I always learned over my time. Here's my thing. If I put a sign, Miss Linda, in that yard and I hold an open house, who's coming? You're gonna get some leads, you're gonna get some but buyers. Who's, who's coming? Buyers. 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 buyers, potential buyers. Yeah. And let me tell you, here's what people don't understand. See, Miss Linda, you walk out and you see Mr. Steffen's house, and this is Mr. Steffen's house here, and you're like, man, that's a crap hole. I don't want to deal with this junker. I'd rather go deal with some other thing. Okay? So you half a it to work on it. Kind of put it at the bottom of your barrel. You go over here, you put it to the side, and you're like, oh, I ain't gonna deal with them, they just whatever, put it on the MLS. Well, here's the thing. Is I can say, you know what, Miss Linda, you're not doing your part, I'm gonna give it to Miss Davenport. Miss Davenport's ecstatic, and she got her listed. So Miss Davenport goes out, she puts a sign in the front yard. She is so stoked about it, she has an open house, and guess what ends up happening? Sells no, who's going to show up at that property? We talk buyers, but who, who in particular is going to show up in a junky house? Two people. Low income. And who else? Exactly. Say that louder. Investors. Investors. You're going to get investors that are going to come out and see that crap pile that you see as a as a junk pile they see it as a gold mine yep. like Travis said last night about the stigmas somebody dies in a property he don't care about it because why <laughs> cheaper price I go in and buy that thing and flip it okay so just because something may not be enticing does not mean that you don't look at it I've taken junk listings, I've taken good listings, I've done them all. And I'll be honest, I prefer the junk ones. You know why? Because when I go put an open house in there, or put a sign there with an open house, these investors come in, and if they're an investor, how many houses do you think they're buying, Ms. Linda? I see. A lot. You get in with one investor, one, Just one investor, you're set for the rest of your life. I'm not kidding you. Is he going to take care of One you? investor. Imagine if you get in with two, or three, or ten. If you get in with one investor, you're set for life. Okay? Again, advice and opinions. That's some of the benefits of also representing as a selling agent. There's advice and opinions that you get to give. You can actually talk to your clients and tell them what they think. And guys and gals, we'll be real honest with you. I have some of the best agents at this. I'm glad I do. But then I have some polite people. I'm messing with you. But I have some polite people. Okay? I promise you, all of you, because eight and I used to be you. I'm just going to be honest. My mom always taught me, be polite, yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am, blah, 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 blah. Okay? In business, you can't do that. No, you can't. You'll get eaten alive. Just go ahead. What happens is in this field, in this industry, when you're giving advice to your clients, you're talking to your clients, and I go over here and I go and look at Mr. Grossman's house, and I walk in and I see dog crap once I walk into the place. Was that you, Mr. Travis, at Winter, or was that you, Stephanie? Did you try this one with Miss Peggy? No. No, it was Brian. I think yeah, you think you're right. One of the guys went with, went with one of my older agents. It was Brian. Yes, you're right. You are right. Went out to a property, walked into a property, and ended up 
They opened the front door to meet the client, and there was dog crap throughout the whole house. Right. Not cleaned up, just been sitting there. There was, basically it was a hoarder's house, we'll just put it that way. And that agent at the point had told me, said, I don't want to deal with that house. That's junk house. And I said, okay, what exactly was wrong with it? They told me everything that was wrong with it. And I said, all right, did you talk to the client about it? No, I was too scared to. No, 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 no. Ms. Davenport, have you ever heard this word or these words before? A come to Jesus talk? Yep. What's that mean, Ms. Davenport, when we have a come to Jesus talk? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you're coming in, and, and in some situations, you're also coming into them, too, and trying to be real honest with them. That's how it's going to be. So if I walk into Stefan's property, and I look at his house, and I see crap all over, my first thing is going to be, Mr. Grossman, can I ask you a question? No, no, not being rude at all here, sir. May I ask why there's dog crap throughout your whole house? What's, what's oh, you're really asking? Yeah, I'm asking you, what's the problem? <laughs> what you gonna say? See, did you see that right off the bat? I, I collected, I don't know. You collected? <laughs> oh, no. Why else would you have crap in the house? I got dogs. What actually happened was, I have one agent, she has no filter. None. Zip up. Not it is. Okay. She walked in and she walked straight up to the guy and was like, you going to pick that up? Yep. And he was like, oh, no, that's through the whole house. I'm too old to get up and, and do all that stuff. Yep. She'll tell you. But see, the thing is, is it needs to be told to your client sometimes. When your client ends up, me and Stefan had a good conversation with one of our clients the other day. They wanted the mobile home and all this moved off their property within 10 days. What did we have to do, Stefan? We called them and said what? Um, Are you sure? That we can, yeah, that we can get it out in 10 days. Otherwise, they're going to get sued. Yeah. Because this client told me this. Day one, about, what was it, a year ago almost that we represented that one? Uh, it's been a while. It's been a while, almost a year. She told me the first time I went out there, I'll have that mobile home and all off that property in the next week. Next week. Where's that mobile home, Stephen? Uh, it's on the property. Where's all the stuff? Has it been moved off? It, it's, all, it's all still on the property. It's all still there. It's all still there. So again, sometimes you have to give advice and, and opinions. Mr. Aiden and Miss Linda got to go out the other day and mr darren i don't know if you're interested or not but she's got a fire truck if you'd like to buy one a boat. and a boat too so um, i mean pm me pictures later you, you know i'm a hustler <laughs> but yeah she last time i went in there she was like well i got a fire truck back here y'all can buy from me i'm like yeah i'm good <laughs> You know how many you know how many people call me a day with weird deals like that? <laughs> hey, now we know who to send them to, y'all. Next time y'all go out there, you know who to send them to dinner. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'll, I'll paint your car for your shit. <laughs> oh my gosh, I actually should probably go buy that fire truck and put our logo on it. We just drive around. Oh. <laughs> and opinions, uh, contract negotiations, confidentiality, all of these are very key. Okay, they're very key. Again, also better understanding the circumstances. A lot of times people get bad news and they quickly what? They get worked up. You as an agent need to help them get up there, but then do what immediately? Pull them back down. Let them work themselves up, let them get it out of them, but also they have to know what? This is, this is the key thing that agents, newer agents, mess up on. 
is this situation. I'm picking on Aiden again, but he did not do this. Aiden goes and he, he finds some bad news out that he's about to end up, he's about to be, uh, you know, his client's about to lose a house. Aiden calls his client, tells his client, hey, Travis, you're about to lose your house, man. Just want to let you know. What? Immediately, Travis is through the roof. And, Aiden, and then he starts going off Aiden at you. And then he starts asking, what happened? Why? When? Why? Who? What? Where? Why? Who? What? Why? And what do you do, Aiden? What happens? What would you do if somebody's over there yelling at you? What do most people do? Sorry. Man, I just work here. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I just work here. Most of the time it is they freeze. They freeze. Travis is here yelling on the phone. Aiden freezes. And he's still going off. Well, every minute that eight or Travis doesn't hear what he wants to hear, what happens? He gets angrier and angrier and angrier until he starts calling you incompetent and stupid and blah, 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 blah. Here's what you do. You never call your client until you have a what? A way. A solution. That's right. An explanation, solution. See, some people want to immediately, they find out the bad news, and they're like, well, let me call that person right away. You do that, what happens? You don't stir the pot even more. Well, now you're sitting there like, like I said with Aiden. You got, you're frozen, and Travis is screaming and hollering in your ear. Okay? If Travis is about to lose his house, you need to find that out, get the anger out of you first, and try to find a, a solution. And then you call that agent back and you tell that agent, hey, what if I give up some of my commission? Or what if I do this? Or what if I do that? Whatever we have to do to get this deal closed. What if we do that? Would you do it? And they're like, maybe. Then at that point, what do you do? You call Travis. You say, Travis, I want to let you know I'm about to share some bad news with you. However, I am trying to make everything right. That's my job. So I don't want you getting very upset. I want you to, to listen to me. What has happened is currently, I got a call from Linda, and Linda went over, and she's trying to kill the deal. Okay? Sorry. But I have been on the phone with Linda, and I'm trying to give up my commission so that you can get this house. So I just want you to know I'm handling it, but I want you to be prepared in case something goes down south. Now, Travis is probably going to get up real high, but then you need to tell him, I understand, Travis, you're furious. I am too. It's not affecting just you. It's affecting me as well. But you hopefully will get a house. I'm not getting anything. Now, when you tell Travis, if you hear that, if Aiden had showed you, say, 60 homes, and he gets you under this contract, and Linda's about to pull out, and you hear and you hear Aiden, and you know Aiden's been working his butt off, and you hear Aiden say, you know what, Travis, my only focus is you get in the house, even if that means I get nothing. What happens to your anger? drops because why because now travis feels bad because what i had aiden go show me 60 freaking properties and he's not getting one penny now i feel like this now where he, where is his anger at it's directed to who to linda not at you anymore it's now linda and that's where it should be in that situation because who's trying to kill the deal? Linda. But if you call your client immediately after you hear something and you tell your client, hey, we're about to lose the deal, Travis. Just want to let you know. Good luck because they're going to say, you're the expert. What's the solution? Tell me. I'm waiting on you, Aiden. Tell me. What's the solution, man? I'm sitting here. Come on. What is it? And if you don't know it, and that's the worst thing you can tell somebody, is I don't know. 
You tell somebody I don't know and they're angry? <laughs> they're out to the moon now. And then they're hanging up on you, immediately calling their lawyer because you're incompetent. Okay? You have to be honest with them. You have to be prepared. You have to know the right words you said, like we talked about last night, uh, Stephen. We're talking about you're all on the right path, but your words are incorrect. You're on the same road with me, but you're going this way and I'm going this way. Okay? You always have a solution. So again, it helps better understand circumstances. It's also an incentive to the market, okay? There also is no conflict of loyalties. Everybody's loyal to each other. It's limited liability for the acts of the buyer's broker, and it's most familiar to the public. So in this situation, the options for representing sellers you have the exclusive seller representation. You have the non-exclusive seller representation. You also have what's called the cooperative sale. You have intermediary agency. Now we've talked about the exclusive seller representation, which is where we're 100% exclusive. The non-exclusive is like your net and open listings. Your cooperative sales is where we're selling on the MLS. And the intermediary is where your broker is representing, they're the middle and they're basically helping their agents represent. Now this is where it's getting fun. They always put the hardest stuff at the end of the class because half of y'all are already just sleeping. Okay? They put the hardest stuff at the end. Here's, here's the stuff. Yeah, what'd you say? We're almost done. We're, we're getting there, guys and gals. We're getting there. Okay? Sub-agency is very important, and this is where people get this confused all the time. Sub-agency is where there is a cooperative sale with the buyer agent or the sub-agent, okay? Remember I said last class, or a couple of classes ago, I said, if you do not have a buyer's representation, who then do you, who, who then do you owe your duty to? Yeah. To the seller. So, Leela, refuses to sign a buyer's rep with me and Mr. Eugene, I'm showing your listing and it's Miss Davenport's house and Miss Leela says I could pay list price but I want to shoot 10,000 under. Do I have to disclose that to you if she refuses to sign? Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm a sub-agent. Even if we're at separate firms. Even if we're at separate firms, I'm a sub-agent. Okay. Sub-agency happens every single day. I'll say that again. Sub-agency happens every single day. But do people follow the rules? No. No, they don't. I see it all the time. They don't end up following the rules. They don't tell the people the stuff they're supposed to. They just leave it blank. Okay. You have to understand that the fiduciary duty is always owed to the seller unless there's a buyer contract. If there is not a buyer representation in your hand, I'm gonna say that again. There's not a buyer representation in your hand, you represent the person that is selling that house, period. But Aiden comes to me and says, but wait a minute, Mr. Justin, hold on, hold on. You're my broker. <laughs> And I went out and I showed Jarek the property. And Jarek ended up, he's going to go sign it when he gets home. So I'm not going to say that. Does that cover you? What did I just say? Needs to be where? In your hand. Not coming to him. Because what could Jarek do when he gets home? He can decide what? I ain't going to sign that paperwork now. I don't want to do it. Okay. So again, fiduciary duty is owed to the seller. There are liabilities and ethics in sub-agency. If a client finds out that Aiden, you went out and you showed that property to, uh, you went out and showed the property, Mr. Jared, Travis's property, and Travis finds out through the grapevine what Jared told you, guess what? 
got some liability and ethics issues because you're a sub agent. Okay. Now, non exclusive seller agency. This is where firms may choose to represent buyers and sellers, but not in the same transactions. Remember, that's intermediary. Okay. So I can, here in my office, we are basically a firm that represents like buyers and sellers. But we don't represent them, we try not to represent them to the best of our ability in the same transaction, unless the parties agree and put it right. Okay. Now we'll show the buyer client other brokers listings, and it usually shows the buyer in-house listings first as the agent for the seller though. Why do we try to show in-house listings first? Why do we do that? More money. More money. 80% of 6% is less than 3% of, or 80% of 3%, is that right, Aiden? No. Oh, you got dummy those numbers again. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's too late. Too late at night, right? I was saying 80 of 6% is less than 80 of 3%. True or false? Well, false. false. That's why you want to show in house. Okay. So if the buyer is not interested in in house properties, they sign a buyer representation agreement and then proceed to see them. So when you go, and this is what a lot of people don't know, a lot of people don't know this, they'll call up their local Century 21, Keller Williams, Remac agent, any of those people, and they'll say, I'm looking to purchase a house. And they'll say, okay, come on in here, Miss Davenport. We're Keller Williams, Century 21 of the big, big ones. Come on in here. Well, she walks in, she says, I'm looking for a four bed, three bath home, 2,000 square feet. I only want to spend $250,000. I want to end up, I want to see these properties throughout Bryan College Station. What's the first thing they do? They go in, they put all her criteria in, but what do they do? They only choose their listings. Let me say that again. They only choose their listings. So they send them to Miss Davenport. She's like, man, I don't like any of these listings. They all suck. Well, some agents will say what? Well, Miss Davenport, sign a buyer rep with me. We'll go show, you know, some other property, some other firm's listings. Okay. But some We'll say, well, Miss Davenport, that's all that's on the market, ma'am. Is it really all? Is that really what's all on the market? No. No. So some people end up, they think they're getting all the listings, when in reality, what happens? They're only getting their, they're only getting their listings. <laughs> There's another type of brokers that sometimes they'll go through the MLS. So Miss Davenport comes in and says she's looking to rent a property. And she says, I'm looking for a rental of four bed, three bath, 2000 a month, blah, 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 blah. The agent goes in and weeds out all of those that are 10 or 15% payment for commission. And they only pull the 100 to 50% commissions. So they send them all to her, but they weed out the ones that she would really like because the fact is they end up, they want to get the most commission. When you do stuff like that, who, whose interest are you putting first? Yourself. Yourself. And if you put yourself first, what ends up happening? You're breaking a lot of laws, a lot of rules. Okay. So you have to make certain that when you're showing properties, like in my office, I tell my agents, your client comes in and they want to see a house, you show them. But I'll say this, I will say this. Stephanie, you go over there. Don't be scratching my feet. Oh, Lord. He, so, something happened at, at somewhere else, and I was thinking he's probably doing that over there. He's oh, brand new okay. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But the key thing here in this situation is say, for example, Stefan, that we go over here and that, say, Stefan does. Stefan's going to go show Miss Davenport some problems. Okay? So you're going to show Miss Davenport some problems. Is it okay for you to go through and find the highest commissions and for you to go over and sell those extremely hard through your talents, but still show her the lower or lower reduced commissions? Yeah. Yes, you can. You can do that all day long. 
He goes, Miss Davenport, are you still getting to see all the properties? Yes, she is. But if Stefan goes in and only picks out the high ones and shows them, she's breaking laws. Or he's breaking laws. Okay. Disclosure issues. The disclosure of seller agent to the seller. Again, there are certain discussions that have to be provided. The listing agent must provide the normal information about brokerage services. The listing agent must inform the seller of any general company policies, what the role of a buyer's agent is. There could possibly be intermediary, commission splitting, opinion of price, and compensation of other parties. If you're familiar with the TAR form, the listing contract, all of these are included. And all those are included for you. The brokerage also represents the seller and not the buyer. The listing agent provides trailer or the information about brokerage services to unrepresented buyer at the first substantial, substantiative dialogue. They cannot provide the buyer with advice that is adverse to the seller's negotiating position, will always be working for the seller's best interest, must disclose all material conditions of the property, and will not disclose the seller's motivation. So, <clears throat> Again, our key points, I kind of want to skip through this because I want to get to the main point. So the key points basically are shown here. Y'all can read through those. I want to jump over here while I have time to the discussion questions. That's where I want to focus on. So my first question tonight is going to go to, um, let's see here. Let me get over here. Mr. Colton, Mr. Garrett. Yes, sir. What's this? What's uh? What's this question? What's the answer to this? The uh, the. Bullet or the hyphen? Both of them. If for the first one. If the buyer is like communicating with the seller's agent and the seller's agent is constantly giving him like information well, let me ask you this question. Just because he's given information, is that not a duty that he has to do by the, by the rules? Isn't he supposed to give disclosure? Yes. Uh huh. So let me help you. I'm going to help you out here, Gary. So this first one here, <clears throat> in what situation could a buyer begin to feel that the seller's agent is also representing the buyer? Well, y'all want to know what it is? The situation is this, is if the seller's agent is going over there giving advice or advising that buyer. So for example, give you a better situation. Miss Linda goes, she's representing Travis. She, she gets Travis under contract. Okay. And Travis tells Miss Linda, hey, Miss Linda. I, I could sell my house for 900,000, but I want to list it for a million. And Miss Linda says, certainly Travis, I'll put it on the market for a million. And after she walks away, she goes over to Miss Leela, tells Miss Leela, girl, let me tell you something. I just went over here and I found the perfect house for you. This house over here, it's listed at a million, but the guy told me he'll end up, he'll accept 900,000. Whose interest you got in mind, Miss Linda? You got Mr. Travis's in mind? Why not? I'm looking for the person who she owes a lot. With the, the money that speaks, right? But he, if he gets a million dollars, you make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. She makes more. She gets six percent. That's right. right. So, in the situation is in this situation, or the, the hypothetical we have, what you got to be careful with in this situation 
is that you've got to make certain that once you list a property and you're told confidential information, you don't go out and end up go over and tell people what you're told. That's confidentiality. Okay. Nor I've had an agent do this before and I had to choose some people out. Come to find out agent list a property and then ends up she gets offers and then she goes back to her client and tells her client, you're way overpriced. You need to accept this offer. Well, if I'm overpriced, then why'd you let me list it that high? The key thing in these situations is, is that you have to make certain if you're going to represent a seller. You represent a seller. You don't represent both. Okay. What are the possible consequences? If they're trying to represent, say that Travis, you're going out and you're got the seller and you're also trying to get the buyer. What's the problem there? You're representing both. What happens? Can you do that? Uh -uh. Agents try to skirt that line all the time. They get a listing. And then once they get that listing, they try to skirt on by and try to get that full 6% to justify it. Okay, I know I represent Stefan here. Okay, I represent Steph. Oh, I have a question. Yeah, I'm I'm really confused at this point. Um, so I thought we couldn't represent both sides. Correct. As an as an agent, you can't. Okay, but the broker can. The broker works as an intermediary by assigning. So let's do it this way, Enrique, okay? You get a listing. Aiden here in my office has a buyer. In that situation, if Aiden wants to put a contract in, his client wants to put a contract in on your property, because you're both sponsored by me, we're in an inter intermediary relationship. Do you see what I'm saying? Because you're both yes. sponsored by me and all of the contracts are with who? The broker, not the agents. So in that situation is, is I can sign two independent people in my office to represent both parties, but I have to keep a, keep a Chinese wall between y'all where y'all are not disclosing confidential information just to try to get a deal done, if you see what I'm saying. Okay, so then how would that work on trying to get the full 6% is what I'm a little confused okay. on. So that's, so that's what I'm going to get to. So what's happening is with the 6%, some agents, say for example, Enrique, that you're one of those agents. I'm just using you as a hypothetical. You're very greedy. You, you want to say something? Well, I am. I have an example of this, basically. Okay, Travis yeah, wants to so, give you one. Uh, just recently, I actually listed one of my family friends, a really close family friend of ours. I listed his house, um, and there was the chance that my dad was actually going to buy it and then use it as an investment property to rent out to other people. But so what ended up happening is because you know they both want me to succeed and they both want to see me do good, they actually came up with the idea that I could be the intermediary between them. I would get the full six percent in the transaction since somebody's going to get their money anyway, might as well, both of them might as well be me. And so they kind of tried to come up with this plan to make me the person for both of them. I'd be the seller and the buyer's agent. And they were like, that way you get all the money. And then I had to basically explain to them, that's not something I can do. So, that's, yeah. but that is an example where people will come up, either people will come up with it themselves, or if I am an agent and you know, I have a friend that's selling a house and then I can find a buyer for it. I might try to do both at the same time, even though, because to me that makes me more money. So I'll try to do it even though I can't legally do it. If I just kind of throw out there that I'm an intermediary or I make it where I'm signing on Justin's behalf. So it's the broker, not me or whatever. And I try to try to skirt that line. That's when it becomes, it, it's still an issue at that point. Okay. That, ma that makes sense. Cause that's honestly like, kind of why I want my license because my parents are in like real estate investing kind of and so I'd list their stuff or they buy. Them. That's totally fine. You can list that stuff and you can buy stuff for them. You just couldn't, you know, 
buy, you can't have them buy something that you listed for somebody else. If you just got a client who wants to sell a house, you list it and your parents want to buy it, you can't also be married to help buy it. That's kind of the mm -hmm. only thing you're setting up for. The only, okay. the only way that you can kind of get through it, Enrique, to be real honest with you, and it's very, very high risk, okay, is if your broker allows you to represent, say, for example, you represent your mom and dad. And they're tra and listing their properties, okay. And say Aiden comes in to buy it, okay. He just walks in. He's a random buyer. He just comes in to purchase it. If Aiden knows real estate, say he was a previous real estate agent, and he knows real estate inside, outside, upside down, and around, and he's comfortable in representing himself, then. Aiden would be representing himself and you would be able to represent just your mom and dad, but not Aiden. But Aiden has to sign off that he's giving up any type of liability for you to do that. But here's the thing. If you do that and something goes south and 99% of the time it does, they're going to come back and Aiden, I mean, Aiden will come back and sue your parents and even try to pull you into it, saying that you were deceptive when you were trying to explain to Aiden the rules. You see what I'm saying? I'll just play, I'll just play it out safe. I'll just play it out safe. <laughs> and, and like I said, and, and Aiden, I mean, uh, Enrique, don't, don't go to the point that you're like, I don't ever want to do it. I have some people, like me and Travis, I think we talked a little we bit about that because my dad owns a bunch of rental properties. Yeah, so he actually knew, he knows a lot about real estate. real estate and the business and how it works and everything. So that was one of the few situations where I was like, I'd be fine representing just our family friends and having him just do the whole buyer side himself because I trust him yeah. and he knows what he's doing. So in that situation, it would have worked out. But I think the more we kind of talked through it, it all just kind of, you know, the more we talked about it, the more we were like, we probably just should just to, just because. And I think my dad ended up not even buying the property at all, but yeah. I mean, if there's, if Enrique, for example, like, you know, you feel like, say it's on the flip side, say that you end up that you're representing a buyer and your parents are selling their house, you may want to end up in that situation. You may want to tell the buyer, you know, hey, how about you end up, I'm going to represent you or I may represent my parents and let me get somebody else in the firm to represent it. It really just comes down to a case by case situation. Like we would have to look at it right. and the person knows what they're talking about, that they have the experience because if they have no experience at all and they're trying to represent themselves, there's a huge risk Enrique where you what, could end up, you could be sued. What I would say the best option in that situation would be is allow the broker to give the whatever side that you don't want to represent, give that to somebody else in the firm. Yep. And you can even work out a deal where if I was representing the buyers or the sellers and I had a buyer come to me and ask about stuff, I would give them to Aiden and then tell Aiden, hey, instead of 3%, how about you take one and a half or 2% as a referral fee because it's still my your lead. I, I, it's my lead that I brought in or whatever. And to Aiden, he's probably fine with that because he didn't really do anything and suddenly he gets a you know, two percent of a transaction that he wasn't a part of in the first place. So yep. you can work through it that way, where you can make deals with people, or you know, even give him all three percent. But then he knows next time if that happens to him, he'll give it to you, and you know, it all comes out even in the end. Yeah, yep. you get a great report. But again, Enrique, it really, like I said, it's not that it's impossible. You just want to kind of keep it. Make certain that your broker knows what you're doing, and y'all talk it out. That's the key thing that I tell people all the time. It sounds like I just want all 6%. <laughs> hey, hey here, we, here we go, Enrique. We'll just, Linda will just cut you a check every time you need 6%. How about that? I don't think so. I need 6%. Uh, okay. I don't think so. <laughs> No, Miss Lila's in Houston, so I'll just take it from her. Oh, Miss Lila, okay. Miss Lila would love that. Uh, uh, so you really want to fight now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one, boo. <laughs> oh, my goodness, y'all. 
<laughs> but no, so again, like I said, is it really comes down to, you know, what you're trying to end up, you're trying to accomplish. I mean, we all want to make 6%. Don't get me wrong. We all do. But so nice. It is. I mean, it is. I, and I've closed a few where I knew that my that the person purchasing knew their stuff, and they told me straight up, I don't want any commission. I just want the house. So you can have all six. And you'll run into that sometimes. You'll run into a buyer that will call you up on your list and be like, I don't want any of your money. You can have all 6%. I'm representing myself. You represent your seller. Let's just get the deal done. And if you come in my office and you tell me that, and that person's willing to put it in writing, I'm going to be like, go for it, Enrique. You go for it. Okay. But if the person is you're just trying to skirt around and trying to be shady, that's where we're going to have a problem. So, but again, I mean, most of the time, most agents are not shady, but it does happen. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Mr. A, what is the best way to handle the situation of selling your own listing to a buyer with whom you've had many prior <clears throat> business relationships? Ask Miss Linda. I'll let you phone phone a friend, Miss Linda. No, Miss Linda is dead. Miss Linda won't help you, man. Wasn't she supposed to always be there for you? It's just like every day at work, isn't it? Right. Got him. There we go. Travis, I tell you, you wait till tomorrow. So the key thing here, and I'll help you out here, because everybody's ready to go home, good to bed. If you're, if for example, say Miss Davenport, she's bought a lot of houses from me over the years. Me and Miss Davenport have had many different conversations. We probably became great friends. We know about each other. She knows my strengths, my weaknesses, all that. Should I, first off, should I represent Miss Davenport in purchasing my house? You're representing your own list. It's my own house, and I'm trying to represent her by my listing, my own home. Should I do that? Uh -huh. No. No. Because is there a conflict of interest? Yeah. Huge, huge conflict of interest. So what should happen? In the best interest, something like that should not even stay in the firm. That is one of those situations where you would tell Miss Davenport, she needs to seek outside representation just because of the fact what happens. There could be undue burden. Now I'm talking about as if I'm a broker. Now as a sales agent, if you're selling your listing and you've been representing Miss Davenport, then the situation is Miss Davenport would need to be assigned to somebody else that's in the firm. And normally it's the most aggressive person in the firm because of the fact is they're going to look out for her interest and not your interest. Does that make sense? But wouldn't, I'm sorry, but wouldn't you at that time, wouldn't that have to be where the broker is brought in of and course discussed the and yes. then the broker will make that decision yes. on who the agent, the next yes. agent would be? And I've had a situation <laughs> like this before. That's the key. That's the answer to every single question is ask Justin. <laughs> Every time, yeah, it's just just he's not always going to be here. You don't know, just ask ask your broker or another right. agent. Yeah, just, talk, just ask around. The key thing here is this situation is number one, and I've had a situation like this in my office before. Agent was selling a property. Their client, they mentioned it to their client that they were selling a property. Client went over, wanted to see it. Agent went and took them to the property to look at it. They started talking numbers, client was interested. I was informed of the matter. I immediately said, you cannot proceed with that sale until one of two things happens. Either that client signs away their right to representation and they have been advised by me that they need to get representation and it's important they get representation or they need to be assigned to another agent in the office. But I also explained to them that everything you just told 
in this situation, we'll say, Aiden, you've now placed yourself at an undue advantage. You put Aiden where he now knows what your top dollar is and bottom dollar. It is best practice that you shy away from this area. If Matt, Miss Davenport wants to buy your house, Aiden, you need to explain to Miss Davenport that there's too much liability. And this probably would be even a very good spot to bring an attorney in, too, and have an attorney involved in the matter, okay? Because an attorney could come in and basically talk to them and discuss those things, okay? Last question. Let's see. Mr. Grossman. What should the listing broker, broker say when the buyer asks the common question? How low will the seller go? Uh, okay, here we go. I'm going to come out to you right now. I'm, I'm just a, I'm a buyer. Okay. You got your listing. You ready? That you want to, one of the listings you got. So a uh, question, how low will your, uh, your, your seller go? I'm not allowed to disclose that information. Well, it doesn't matter. You can tell me. No, that's confidential. No, no, it's okay. You can tell me. I can't tell you. Come on, you can tell me. I just said I can't tell you. You can tell me. I can't. Okay, how about we play hypothetical here? How about hypothetically you're not an agent right now, and I'm not a buyer right now. I mean, hypothetically, we're going through, how well, how much would they go? Hypothetically, well, hypothetically, I could get sued. Well, you're not going to tell me? No, I'm not going to tell you. Miss Linda, how much are they going to pay? <laughs> I well, you, you don't understand the in or the out. That's I right. We're into the sheet I see here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Three, <laughs> five hundred forty. That's it. Three hundred and forty thousand dollars. Exactly. You don't. No matter how much, and I promise you guys and gals, Mr. Travis, how many times did you hear that probably today in your show? Quite a bit. Quite a bit, right? So in that situation, is we don't know. Let's submit an offer. Let's see how low they'll go. That's your best answer. I love when they ask the buying agent because then you're just like, I don't even know who they are. I, exactly. I don't even know. I don't have no idea. Or a company. I don't even know who owns this place. Exactly. I have no idea. Okay. All right. So that ends our lecture for tonight. I know we went over just a little bit. But again, that ends our lecture. Steph, I'm going to have you uh, stop our recording.